And thank you all for coming as well. I know it's summer, so um, turning up in a room full of geeks isn't necessarily the best way to enjoy your evening, but I appreciate you all coming. Um, having some challenges with my computer, so we'll see how that goes. Very briefly, I'm Shahid Iqbal. I'm a freelance hands-on consultant um, working with Azure, .NET, and more recently kind of Kubernetes, Docker, things like that, do workshops. I work with companies helping them with the Azure stuff, really. Uh, I'm a developer, I've been for over 10 years, and I'm Microsoft MVP. Um, some of these, these slides I use in uh, other conferences when I'm abroad, so obviously I'm based in the UK. Uh, and I also run a, a meetup in Milton Keynes, so if you're ever down in that area, feel free to get in touch. I was glad to uh, have people come along. The main reason for this slide really is my contact details. Um, I'm not here to kind of talk to you for like an hour, or hour and a half more than happy to take questions as we go along. If you can't hear me at the back, just shout, tell me to speak up. If you can't see anything, please just, you know, it's, it's quite relaxed. I'm, um, I'm not, too fu not too fussed about um, being interrupted or anything. So in terms of the agenda, basically what we're going to cover is uh, some of the technical challenges that you encounter when you move towards microservices architectures. And then really what we'll talk about is how we can address those challenges using cloud native technologies, a variety of these. Um, essentially, the reason I did this talk was you know, people are hearing about Kubernetes and containers and various other technologies. And I just wanted to contextualize where these things came from. They're, they're trying to solve a problem that's been created by something else. You know, it's usually the way it goes in our industry. Um, so that's what it is. In terms of what we're not going to cover, I'm not going to talk about how we decompose your monoliths into kind of microservices. I'm sorry if that's what you came here for. Hope you enjoy the pizza. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not going to deep dive into kind of containers and how we create them. Again, people who come to meetups, generally speaking, we've been hearing about containers for over two, year, two years now, probably. Sick to death of it. And I'm not actually going to dive into Kubernetes in any great detail. I'll cover some of the high-level concepts. And I'll share a link at the end to a video I've done where I do spend a lot more time on Kubernetes more specifically. So it's probably a good time now to get some questions from you folks. So how many people are working on microservices architectures, what they describe as microservices architectures? Nobody? Wow, OK, that's unusual. Normally, you get some, you get some hands up. So what about people using containers? OK, is there, there's a hand up in the back in production. Cool. And anyone using Kubernetes? Wow, OK, cool. I'm guessing service meshes then are definitely not on anyone's horizon at the moment. OK, great. Um, we're going to cover through, you know, get through a lot of concepts, so hopefully everyone's well refreshed. As I said, please stop me if something's not clear, if you want me to uh, clar clarify anything. And I'm, I'm around uh, later on this evening, so if, if you don't want to ask questions publicly, that's absolutely fine. Um, come and speak to me afterwards. So microservices, I'm sure most people have seen a definition of microservices, and I'm not going to kind of labor the point here. I uh, just wanted to highlight a couple of things, really. You now, we talk about these. Um, services being aligned, you know, modular components, and they're aligned to business capabilities. Um, and then the really important they're independently deployable. And this is where, it's one of the areas where a lot of people go wrong when they, they move to microservices, they don't have them independently deployable. Um, there's another feature that I often hear people talk about in microservices that's not mentioned on this, this little snippet. Can anyone take a guess what, what I'm talking about? So it's to do with size. So you often hear people talk about it's got to be X number of lines of code, should be rewritable in two weeks, so, you know, one pizza team, since pizza's at the back, one pizza team should be able to rewrite in X number of weeks, and all of this thing. And uh, that particular aspect of microservices really annoys me because that in no way meets any of these other criteria. Why should your service be aligned to business capability and then be 100 lines of code? It's a nonsense. You know, I, I personally think when people go down this route, they tend to go the wrong way and they make many, many microservices, really small ones, and managing really small services and a numerous you know, amount, a high number of them, is really tricky. So if you take away nothing else from this talk today, if you're at a decision point where you've got to decide whether something should be one service or two services, go for one. Go for one, run it in, in production, and then understand how it runs, and then figure out, actually, this is the code in here, we're scaling this this bit of the code up, this bit of code is not actually that well related to it. We should split these out, and that's how you should do it. So if you ever add that decision point, please don't 
don't think the more the better. And I see people talk about they've got X, you know, we've got 90 microservices in our company and they seem to think it's a badge of honor and I think it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a badge of honor. It should be, a, you know, something that you should be certainly controlling tightly if not being, being ashamed of it. So, we, you know, talk about these benefits and I've kind of touched them already, independently scaling these services. They, each deployment now is, is smaller, so it should be less risky. Another one that actually gets often, often overlooked is this cognitive load. If you're working on a complex system and you don't have microservices, you have to have the whole system in your head when you're working on a piece of functionality because you need to understand where it's going to impact. With microservices, you've got a really clear boundary. This is the API surface of this particular microservice. That's, that's as far as I need to consider. Beyond that, it's not a problem for this particular service. That helps a lot. And obviously, we can distribute work across uh, other teams as well and various other benefits. So how do we do this? How do we start this journey? Well, we have a, a monolith. In this case, you know, it's a well-structured monolith. I've got it designed with modules, and the modules are really clear, um, have a clear purpose. <coughs> And of course, what we do is we go bang and we turn into microservices. Uh, now, of course, we know that's not actually how it works. Well, actually, first thing is, uh, talking about microservices, there should be hexagons. So let's fix that first. There we are. That's better. Always have to be hexagons if you're talking about microservices. It's, it's the law. Um, no, of course not. You don't, you don't suddenly just take an existing monolith and break it up into multiple microservices and, and be done. Um, generally speaking, you go down a bit of a journey. So you de decompose your monolith. So let's take the monolith again and then let's, let's pick a target. Let's pick out one of these uh, modules. And as I said, in this case, it's well structured. So hey, you know, th this is arguably easy. And what we do is we pull out one of these services and we create a new microservice. OK, let's have a think about how we're deploying this. So previously, our monolith was deployed on you know, a web server somewhere. Let's say it was .NET Framework or something. And we deployed it on a single server. Uh, maybe we had multiple servers. Now, the new component, we want to keep, keep that isolated from the existing components. Maybe it's running newer versions of frameworks. So what we need to do is we need to put that on its own server. OK, that's fine. We are now managing twice as many servers as we were before, but that's fine. Reality is that new service probably needs to talk back to the monolith, needs to do some communications. So now we need to make sure we have some networking capability between them. And imagine if this was Windows and Linux, for example. Things are getting more and more complicated. Let's carry on the kind of evolution. And naturally, we pull out another component. And again, for isolation, we deploy it on another server. We've got more networking. And you can see where this is going. You know, if we take it to the natural conclusion on this small four-service you know, four application, <coughs> we've now got four servers, four sets of networking, and you know, we, one of the things that people talk about microservices is, hey, you can write in whatever language you want. So, hey, our team wrote in whatever language they wanted. And they picked, no Elixir, unfortunately, but hey, they used, hey, you know, all the other trendy languages. Actually, Node, Node's probably not trendy anymore, is it? Um, so now we've got this problem as well. We've got dependencies. We've got different versions of different dependencies, different frameworks, different runtimes. The complexity is getting more and more in terms of just deploying these things. Now, of course, applications are perfectly fine until users come along. And those pesky users want access to these applications. It could be another system, but let's assume it's, uh, it's users. So now we need to punch holes into firewalls. We need to you know, expose things publicly. From a single monolith, a single deployment to a single web server, things are now looking you know, decidedly more complicated. As I said, we've got multiple frameworks, multiple versions, multiple servers. What we've done is basically said, hey, it works on my machine times n number of services now. now. Before it was just the one thing. Now we've got multiple opportunities for, hey, it worked on my machine. So let's have a look at some of these problems that we've you know, created by moving to microservices. As I said, we've got multiple deployments, and so now we've got a consistency problem. <coughs> we need to make sure that we have the right versions of frameworks on the different servers. We have um, the different runtimes available for each of those applications. We've got multiple servers, and we've got networking and everything else. So things are a lot more complicated on the infrastructure side and the environment. We've now got multiple points of failure and latency, because now what you used to have was an in-memory function call. You know, your function A called function B, and it was in-memory, and everything was fine. 
Now it's making a network call. Our networks are not reliable. And not only that, you add a huge amount of latency uh, potential on networks as well. What about debugging? Now again, previously you had a single application that you would just spin up, attach a debugger to it, step through the code, probably pretty much see what's going on. Now a single request may span multiple applications, multiple microservices. So debugging gets a bit harder now as well. Kind of touched on the networking already, but you've got you know, routing rules. It, within the actual uh, microservices, but also external rules as well. Kind of touched on it with the debugging, but again, you've got requests coming in that are spanning multiple services. So how do you trace a request? How do you understand what a request is doing? Where, which component is causing a slow response time, for example? And <clears throat> now we've got much bigger surface area. So our security concerns are increased because we're running multiple services, multiple servers, yada, yada, yada. So it sounded good when we thought, hey, let's move to microservices because everyone else was doing it. But did we really think these things through? Now, we've taken what was quite a straightforward issue. And now we've just turned it into a bit of a headache, really. So with these kind of problems in mind, let's now have a look at how a variety of, kind of technologies can try and help us address these problems. So we look at the first uh, problem about deployments and multiple environments. So this is where you know, maybe containers can, can help. So briefly, for those who don't know what containers are, essentially it's a, it's a package which encapsulates your application and its dependencies. So now your CI system creates containers, container images more specifically, instead of binaries or zip files or MS deploy packages. <clears throat> the key thing with containers is they give you this isolation, they give you this consistency. So containers can run all the dependencies are packaged within the container. It doesn't get interfered with by any other container running on the same platform. So you can have different versions of the frameworks. So for example, if you're running .NET Core, and we have two different versions of .NET Core. .NET Core is probably a bad example because you can actually uh, localize the version to the application. But um, that kind of problem of having having a dependency on a platform version that you can't then increment across two versions of the application. I often say, think of containers as lightweight VMs. They're really fast to start up. They give you that kind of isolation that uh, VMs give you. It's more to say they're not VMs. They don't give you the same security isolation that VMs give you. Um, so I would caveat that kind of comment, which is why it's, it's in quotes. <coughs> the key thing is they're portable. So if they work on your machine, they should work on the platform that you're going to run them in your production cluster. As long as you've got the container runtime, they're portable and they should work. So it kind of helps avoid that problem. OK, so now we've got containers. What about deploying these containers? Well, what we do is we can now deploy multiple containers onto machines. We get some isolation. So we can run, we can pack these machines densely with containers. What happens if one of those machines dies? Well, you kind of need to know the machines died, but again, that's kind of noddy stuff. Hopefully, everyone's got the relevant kind of alerting in place. You need to know what was running on those machines. You need to find somewhere else to run them. These are all things you have to manage if you're going to run containers yourself. So this is where so my animations were slightly out of whack. Oops, I went backwards, that's why. Um, <clears throat> this is where container orchestrators come to the rescue. And there are a number of container orchestrators, but the one that I think has kind of won the war, if you like, is Kubernetes. It's the one that I think most people are probably familiar with. So Kubernetes is an open source container orchestrator. It was originally created by Google. Uh, it's no longer owned by Google. It's a uh, project as part of the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, who actually uh, oversee a number of projects. I bought a load of stickers at the back there. There's a load of stickers for all the CNCF projects, well, most of them anyway. The key thing is, it helps you run container-based applications across multiple machines, fundamentally. So what does that look like? So we take, uh, take a bunch of machines, and essentially we install a container orchestrator across these machines. And then, particularly as a developer, I don't care about the underlying machines anymore. All I do is I deploy my containers. I give my containers to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes will run them. <coughs> now, if at any point one of those machines dies, Kubernetes will actually detect that there's some containers that should be running and they're not. 
and it will find somewhere else to run them. And you don't need to be you know, paged at three o'clock in the morning to deal with it. That's just something the system deals with. Kubernetes has a number of features, kind of crudely demonstrated container orchestration. It also gives you a platform for managing configuration and secrets. It allows you to create self-healing applications and allows you to have auto-scaling. Um, I do a slightly longer version of this talk where I deep dive into auto-scaling. So I'm not going to do that today. Um, if anyone's coming to York tomorrow, <laughs> I suspect not, I will probably cover it there because I'll have a bit more time. And uh, it gives you service discovery and load balancing. So it allows you to um, discover where services are using simple DNS and load balancing traffic. So a lot of these things that you would expect from a platform. And incidentally, so the first talk was about Elixir and Elixir seems to have a lot of these capabilities in there. You might be wondering what's the difference. Well, obviously Elixir is a language platform. So everything has to be in Elixir. With Kubernetes, it can be any language you want. As long as it's in a container, you can run it. So it can be some language you've created at home in your shed. Some people like creating languages. It could be that as long as it can be containerized, it can run on Kubernetes. So you get that kind of uh, consistent platform irrespective of the actual language you're using. And it has some basic traffic management. I'll, I'll touch on that a li little bit later. Um, and has many more. As I said, I'm not going to deep dive into these. Uh, I'll link towards the end video, which, which explains some of these in a bit more detail. I'm going to touch on Ingress, and I, <coughs> I'm going to come back to it later on, and you'll see why. Well, I just want to touch on Ingress. So in this example here, I've got a deployment. I've got an application. I've got a cluster with three nodes in it, and I've got some applications deployed. I'm running multiple instances of my application. And what Ingress allows you to do is give you a, essentially have a single entry point into your cluster where you can then map traffic and route traffic. Sorry, I spend a lot of time speaking to Americans and Australians. They say route instead of route. So if I say route, I mean route. Um, <clears throat> it allows you to uh, route traffic depending on various parameters. So in this example here, my public IP address, I've got a, a CNAME record set up in my DNS. And I've got a, a rule that says, if traffic is coming from a host head of app one, send it to this app one service. And then that will actually load balance across the multiple instances of the application. So that's great. Similarly, if I want to um, have app two, I've got the same IP address, the same public IP address. And now I map the CNAME record for app two. And because the host header has the app two name in it, it will get routed to app two because that's how I've got it set up. The issue with, um, so this is kind of out of the box in Kubernetes. So one of the problems that you have, and we'll talk about this a lot more later, is that's essentially what we can do. So we can do a root based as well. So slash or path based, sorry, you know, slash order slash whatever. But we only really have this choice of either sending it all to one or to the other. What we'd like to do is to be able to send maybe some percentage of traffic in various ways. And this is why um, certain technologies have been built on top of Kubernetes, to try and help address it. So we'll come back to that. <clears throat> now at this point, I'm saying to you use containers and then run Kubernetes as a way of solving the complexity of running microservices. Now, you should rightly be sitting there going, that's bloody insane. Uh, how can running Kubernetes be any easier, uh, be solving the complexity problem of running multiple services? And the short answer is, yeah, you're right. Uh, if you're running Kubernetes yourself, that's not, an, that's not a small task you know, to take on. So <clears throat> this is where these managed Kubernetes providers kind of come in. There's a heap of them. I'm really only kind of touching on the main cloud providers. So Google, Azure, and, and Amazon. And they all have these managed Kubernetes services. And what these managed Kubernetes services do is they take away a fair chunk of the complexity of running Kubernetes from you, particularly around the master nodes. The, um, they're, the, they're the difficult bit is the, running the master nodes, the etcd cluster, and everything else. So by running a managed service, you, t you reduce that complexity significantly. Now, it's important to point out that it doesn't mean running Kubernetes is free. It's not, there's still a, you know, a learning curve. People have to learn, understand how Kubernetes work. Even as developers, I think you need to understand the platform you run on. So it's not free, but it gives you so much power, so much capability, and it's ubiquitous that actually it's worth that effort. So let's go back to our checklist. So hopefully shown you or talked about with the containers, uh, we reduce the complexity of the multiple deployments and the consistency of those because our container will work wherever it runs, it will run on our production system. 
by using Kubernetes, we create a uh, consistent environment. So we reduce a lot of the complexity of running um, multiple servers ourselves and having to manage, manage them, you know, networking, etc. Kubernetes has the capability of creating you know, um, self-healing applications and Kubernetes itself can tolerate node losses and things like that. So we've hopefully addressed you know, a fair chunk of the uh, multiple points of failure problem. What about debugging? So, so far, I don't think we've really covered debugging. I don't think we've solved any, any problems with debugging. In terms of networking, well, I've said, you know, I've shown you some of the ingress stuff, I've shown you the, uh, talked about load balancing and service discovery. So <coughs> there, is a, there is a platform we can work with within Kubernetes, so that's great. Um, but I think we can do better. In terms of tracing and logging, um, again, I don't think we've really moved the bar on this at all so far. So we'll come back to that one. And then security will, again, because we're running Kubernetes, we have a consistent approach for running these services. You run Kubernetes in one place, you can run it in another. There's a consistent platform that everyone's working from. So we have addressed some of those concerns. But th again, I think we can do better. So let's have a look at this debugging applications. You know, this is where some of the tooling may come to the rescue. Now, this is an area that's in you know, really rapid flux. There's a lot of stuff going on in this area. Almost certain this slide's out of date. Um, every day I open Twitter, I end up with 10 or 12 tabs of new things to look at with regards just Kubernetes along. Let's have a look at the kind of workflow. So I'm, <coughs> I'm working with um, code now and I'm deploying to Kubernetes. How does, that, how does that workflow now look? Well, I'm writing code and that's fine. That's, that's still the same. I'm pushing that to some kind of repository because we're all using code repositories now and this isn't the old school Wild West anymore. That repository is going to build some containers. Um, so as I said, the artifacts from a CI system now is no longer a you know, zip file or whatever, it's a container. Container image more specifically, should, should update that. Um, <coughs> these container images get pushed to a container registry. And then we create or we update some kind of deployment package for Kubernetes. So this is things, something like Helm. And then that package gets deployed to Kubernetes. So we need, we're going to break this down. We're doing kind of local development here. We're doing continuous integration or integration, if you like. And then we're doing deployment, uh, continuous or otherwise. Problem here is that's quite a long workflow to go through. If you just want to make a you know, quick change, you want to see what you know, debug a problem. And there's another problem with this, which particularly with microservices is if you have dependent services. So say I'm working in service A. And service A is called from a front-end service, and then that calls another service, service B. <coughs> if I want to work on service A in my development environment, I've got a number of options for how I deal with this particular scenario. So what I could do is I could create some mock stub services, and I could just swap out the calls from those mock services, and that might work fine. You know, I've got to remember to... Uh, make sure that when I deploy to different environments, those values are swapped out. That adds a bit more complexity from my configuration point of view, but hey, that might work, especially if it's a handful of services, I might be okay. <coughs> Another option is I could run all of my services on my local machine. So I could spin up all of the services that my service needs to work with. This is probably the most common approach at the moment. Um, and again, that could work fine. Three services is probably fine. Um, my laptop is struggling at the moment because I'm running Docker with this deal and it's, this is a 16 gig i7 machine and it's struggling a bit at the moment. So if you had quite a lot of these services, it's a good excuse to go and get another, another you know, computer from your, from your boss, but maybe not that scalable. Another option is what we do is we run everything in a remote cluster. Um, now that comes back to the same problem we had before as well about how do I debug, how do I kind of do a quick change? But we could run that in a remote cluster but how do I share what I'm doing? Do we have a cluster reach? Do I have a cluster with a namespace just for me, my team? Um, there's some challenges there. What if we could find the sweet spot, or what I think is a sweet spot, which is we run all of our dependent services on a remote cluster somewhere, and we run the service we're working on on our local machine. <coughs> this is where a service that's actually not that well known called Azure DevSpaces comes in. 
So what Azure DevSpaces does is it allows you, it works with AKS, allows you to deploy your microservices architecture application to the cluster, to your dev cluster, for example, and it will give you a front-end you know, domain name that you can hit. Now, when I'm working on the service, for example, now I want to work on V2 of my service A on my laptop. What I do is I create a new dev space on my laptop, and that dev space gets pushed to the cluster. But the really neat thing is, what uh, dev spaces does, it gives me another URL, another domain. It typically, it appends the name of my workspace.s, and then that same URL. So it's a deterministic URL. And if I hit that URL, what happens is I hit the front end, existing front end service that was running in the cloud. That request that it makes gets routed to my local laptop, to the service that's running on my laptop, the V2, if you like. And if my service is calling another service, that will automatically get routed back up to the cloud where that service is running. So that's pretty cool. The nice thing with this is that uh, dev space is created in, in the cluster and actually gets pushed up automatically. So I can finish working on service A, V2, and um, I can go home and somebody else can come along and they can test that service by hitting the same um, endpoint. Now my laptop's switched off, I've gone home, it's been pushed up to the cluster. They'll get the same experience. They'll hit the existing front end, they'll bounce down to my version of the service, and they'll across to service B. So this dev space is pretty cool. What I can do now is on my colleague who may be working on service B, V2, they may want to use my service A, V2, they can inherit from my dev space, and they will get the same experience except now this service V2, service A, would actually call, well, in reverse, but yeah, it'd, it'd actually hit, they'd get their own uh, URL. If they hit that URL, it'd go from there to there to there and back. It's pretty cool. You can actually go, I think you can go as deep as you want, but I wouldn't recommend it. So as I said, it's one of these services not that well known. It is an AKS only service. Um, <clears throat> so it works with Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. Just needs some add-ins, uh, some extensions. Uh, it has first-class support for .NET, .NET Core, obviously, Node.js and Java, and then there is limited support for other languages as well. So you just need, uh, essentially, you just need to have them containerized. <coughs> the nice thing with this is actually, if you, even if you're not using AKS for your kind of Kubernetes deployments, you could set up an AKS cluster for dev test, use this dev spaces to work through your application and create it. Ultimately, at the end, the artifacts are always the same. It can be containers and manifest files for Kubernetes. You can then deploy them to whatever cluster you're using, whether it's a private cluster, or whether it's you know, GKE or whatever else. Um, I'll stand corrected if, if it's changed, but as far as I know, nobody else has got a service like this. There's nothing else comparable. There is a project, CNCF project called Telepresence, which is one of the stickers over there, uh, which lets you essentially attach to a remote um, container and debug it but it doesn't have this kind of routing capability. And uh, it was actually, it's been around for quite a long time. It was called Visual Studio Connected Environment, if anyone was following this. Um, and the thing with Azure services is if they don't GA within say six months, you normally start getting a bit nervous for them. You know, the, the head's on the chopping block usually. But actually that did GA uh, on May the 6th, which was build. So it's now you know, GA service and the docs are there quite good. If you want to see how it works behind the scenes, uh, there's, there's quite detailed explanations. I can't really go into it detail now. Um, <clears throat> so let's have a quick demo of that. What I'll do is I'm, uh, I'm not online, so I'm just going to use a video for the demo. Um, but let's see how this works. Is that somebody yawning? Am I boring you? Oops, you didn't see that. And I now can't see my... Uh, Start menu. <laughs> oh, this is classic. My laptop. Oh, there we are. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll show you something in Visual Studio Code, and then I'll run the video. This is really lagging. Um, come on. So what I've got here is I've got two uh, ASP.NET Core applications. I've got a MVC application, the front end, and then I've got a back end web API. So this is, can everyone see that okay? Let's close that. See that okay at the back? Cool. Uh, so what we've got is, this is just the details action. 
uh, on the home controller and it's going to make a request to the back end. For those who are not that familiar with Kubernetes, this is the nice thing with Kubernetes is it uses DNS. So my back end service is called back end. So it's just going to do HTTP call to back end slash API slash details. Um, there's this funky bit here, which is some headers. And this is what um, DevSpaces uses to propagate um, the headers. They're fairly harmless once they're in there. It, they're not going to cause you any issues. But essentially, what it's doing is it's going to call the backend service and it's going to display the results in a, um, in, in a view, basically. The backend service it's calling is this one. And that's just the bog standard web API. So it's just going to call the get method and it's going to return, in this case, v1 backend details. Um, so I'm going to switch to the video and hopefully the video plays. So what I've done is I've got this deployed to the Azure Dev Spaces. <coughs> and uh, I've split my pane so you can see on the left hand side. Uh, so it runs here. Yeah, on the left hand side, on the right hand side, I've got that back end web API. And now I'm doing v2. So this is my change request to do work on v2. So I've got that running and I've got a breakpoint. So you can see up there, I'm calling the front end and it's got some GUID. And then that's my, my URL. And that's v1, v1. So now I can start the debugger on VS, VS Code. And I've got the breakpoint there as well. So on my local laptop, I'm only running this service. Nothing else is running. Once that debugger uh, starts up, if I now change that URL, so now I'm going to put my dev space name at the front. If I hit that, what we should see, so video will definitely work unless the video crashes. There we are. Uh, <laughs> no need to build up suspense was there. Um, it hits a breakpoint. And then if I continue the breakpoint, we can see now we're getting the V2. So that was calling the front end that was hosted in the cloud, and that call through the back end, which is running on my local machine. Um, so that's just a really quick, quick kind of demo of that. Obviously, now I've stopped this debugger. I've stopped running. Uh, but I can still refresh that page, and it's still working fine because it's running in the, it's pushed it up to the actual cloud. <clears throat> that was a really, really quick demo of that. Let's go back to the slides. How are we doing for time? Uh, Eight o'clock. I'm hoping that will disappear in a second. We'll carry on. Um, so let's come back to that checklist. So debugging applications, hopefully I've shown you actually we can now do some quite interesting things with debugging. Uh, so we can take that one off. Networking, traffic routing, well, I haven't really changed, the, changed anything on that so far. Same with tracing, same with security. Well, nothing else has really changed. So with these three elements, essentially what we're talking about here is networking, network management between the services. And this is where, of course, service meshes come to the rescue. Service mesh is a really hot topic and much like Kubernetes, there are people kind of jumping to adopt service meshes, even though are probably not really ready for them or need them. So I'll, I'll explain what they are and I'll show you how cool they are, but my takeaway is we don't, please don't rush into it and I'll hopefully cover that right at the end as well. Um, there are a number of these uh, products. I kind of mentioned the, the three main ones. Um, Istio is probably the most well-known one I'll, I'll speak about a lot more. Um, so what is a service mesh? So essentially, service mesh is an infrastructure layer that's dedicated, for you know, dedicated to handling service-to-service -service communications. So its job is, in a kind of microservice architecture, you've got a lot more complexity around where services live and routing to them and various other things. And its job, essentially, is to manage all that for you. So the Istio is the most well-known, the most popular, I think, and there's a good reason for that. So it's an open source project. It's being led by you know, uh, IBM, Lyft, and Google. Uh, I think Google are the core project maintainers at the moment. It's not a CNCF project, so it's not a project like, Google, like Kubernetes is or various other ones. LinkerD is another example. It's a CNCF project. Currently, Istio isn't a CNCF project, but <clears throat> I'd fully expect it to become at some point. So it runs on top of Kubernetes, although actually uh, Istio isn't, isn't limited to just Kubernetes. It will actually run on uh, many other platforms, even just VMs, uh, Linux VMs. So what does it give you? So it gives you things like network error handling. So this thing that like retry logic, circuit breakers, timeouts, things like that. Now, I presume most people are .NET developers. I know there's at least one who isn't, but most people are .NET developers. Probably heard of Poly. People heard of Poly? A few people nodding their heads, putting their hands up. Cool. 
So Poly gives you a lot of the same capabilities. <coughs> so you're probably wondering, well, why would I use this when I've got Poly? It's a great question. Um, if you're writing only .NET Core and are only ever going to write .NET Core stuff, then maybe Poly's fine. You don't need this stuff. Um, the key thing with something like Istio is it pushes this concern down to the infrastructure layer. So no longer is it something that's running in code. My policy is you're not having to write in code. You would just make a service call as you would normally. The other advantage is if you are running different languages and different platforms, you know, say you're writing some stuff in Rust or some stuff in Java, there's almost any equivalent libraries to Poly in those platforms, but are they going to have exactly the same feature set? Maybe, maybe not. You're going to have to learn uh, you know, those different languages, uh, those libraries rather. And if there's a bug in the particular library, you know, critical vulnerability, then you have to redeploy that application to fix that vulnerability. By pushing it down to the platform, it becomes a platform concern, not a dev concern. So that's pretty cool. You, as a dev, you still have to handle things like what happens if the circuit breaker is open, you know, uh, deal with stuff like that. But you're not having to write the policy yourself. <coughs> allows you to have rate limiting. So you can apply rate limiting to services. You know, you can do this at any point. It doesn't have to be something you have to think about at the start. You could have a system running and you realize you've got a misbehaving system that's causing some problems. You can apply a rate limit to it. You can do traffic shifting. We'll talk a bit more about traffic shifting later. This is allows you to shift traffic um, from one service to another and you can apply rules and weights to that traffic. This is where the ingress things are. I'll talk, I'll talk about a bit more in a second. Fault injection. So one of the challenges with microservice architectures is how do I test my application that handles faults correctly? You know, having a reproducible fault injection is quite tricky. Istio lets you do this. So you can have a fault, a particular kind of error code was always returned from a service call. <coughs> That's pretty cool. It lets you do some testing, allows you to do some chaos engineering, chaos testing as well, if you like. And it allows you to apply uh, service to service communication policies and encryption. And again, we'll talk a bit more about this in a second. And finally, it allows you to get some distributed tracing of your requests. And hopefully in the demo, I'll show you the dashboards for that and you can see that. The next slide is a little bit scary. Um, don't let it put you off too much. It's uh, Istio architecture. Broadly speaking, what we have is we have two planes. We have what we call the data plane. This is where the communications, the data for your application flows. And then we have the management plane. This isn't an Istio specific kind of thing. This is a very common um, approach. In the data plane, what we have is we have our service in a container and Istio injects a proxy alongside that service as a sidecar container. That proxy transparently intercepts all the traffic that's being sent to and from your service. And then that allows Istio to apply policies and do various other clever things with that traffic. <coughs> now you're probably wondering about that proxy. Well, if everything's going through a proxy, surely this is, you know, is that like a Nginx or a HA proxy on, a, on every, every container, every service? That could be quite you know, heavyweight. The proxy itself is written in C++. It was created by Lyft something Lyft have used internally for, for a long time. They created and they open sourced it. And it's been created for this kind of cloud native application. So it's extremely low latency. I believe it's less than a millisecond it adds to the overall request. Um, Istio itself does have some overhead. My laptop is running really slow because partly because of that. Um, Linkerd is another one of the service meshes that as I said, it has, is uh, actually lighter weight than Istio is. Not as fully featured, but if you're thinking about these things, then Linkerd may be the best place to start first, to give you, give you that kind of introduction. <coughs> so that's the proxy. And yeah, so the management plane is essentially how you configure the proxy. All of this stuff essentially, its job is to configure the proxy, uh, make it easier for you to do that. So in terms of deploying um, Istio, Again, one of the really nice things with Kubernetes is it gives you a platform that you can deploy applications to really quite easily using something like Helm. Um, so you can use Helm to deploy Istio, and Istio uses these custom resource definitions. Uh, if you're not that familiar with Kubernetes, don't worry too much. This is a way you can extend Kubernetes. So again, one of the really powerful features of Kubernetes is you can extend its behavior by deploying things to Kubernetes, which is pretty cool. <coughs> there are a number of these resource definitions, so it can be a little bit scary when you first look at um, Istio. 
When it comes to your application, the really nice thing is that proxy that I showed you, that's injected alongside your sidecar, uh, as a sidecar rather, that can be injected completely seamlessly to your application. So your application doesn't need to know about Istio. It could have been written without any knowledge of Istio whatsoever, and you can apply those injection policies, those fault tolerance, um, fault injection, those rate limiting, various other things, <coughs> as soon as you apply it. Now, the way it does that by it essentially transparently injects the proxy into the, your sidecar. Some people don't like that's a bit of magic, so you can generate, you know, essentially update your manifest files to have that proxy applied by using the command line tool that comes with this here. Uh, I want to touch on this. This is a fairly new addition. So um, people recognize that service meshes are becoming really popular, and there's a number of different service meshes out there. And the problem with Kubernetes is, you know, people don't like to force somebody down a particular route with Kubernetes, you know, having to use a particular framework. So they've abstracted their networking behind a CNI container networking interface. They've uh, abstracted their um, storage behind a storage interface. So SMI, or service mesh interface, is designed to do exactly the same thing for service meshes. So it tries to generalize the service meshes for Kubernetes and then allow you to swap out the implementations. So you're now working with service mesh interface. You're not worrying about the more specific details of Kubernetes, uh, sorry, Istio or Linkerd or console or whatever service mesh you're using. As long as it adheres to the interface, and there's normally an adapter, as you can imagine, you, you can swap out the specific implementation. So it's an open source project. Microsoft uh, leading it with a number of other um, open source companies. Most of them are service mesh related companies. No surprise, really. <clears throat> and at the moment, and I think this hasn't changed, it has three of the most common, which is traffic policies. So this is applying policies to your traffic by encrypting them. Telemetry, so being able to capture metrics of your traffic and then shifting the traffic and waiting. Now I'm not going to um, show you service mesh interface, I'm going to show you Istio directly, but um, there'll be equivalent parallels for all the stuff I'm talking about now. So I talked about these service-to-service -service communications. So imagine this service, this uh, kind of application here with, with four microservices. And this, this is the demo I'm going to be showing you later. So it, it may not be so relevant. But for example, you know, this product service is talking to review service, talking to this rating service. And within the cluster, that traffic by default is unencrypted. You know, that's just using standard, you know, unless you've specifically implemented STLS. Within the cluster, that service is, is going through uh, over the wire in clear text. So if somebody can get into your cluster, they can snoop on that traffic. They can see the traffic. Now, product ratings, it's not a big deal. If this was more of a sensitive application, you know, <coughs> billing service or something or, or whatever, you wouldn't want that. So what Istio lets you do, and Service Mesh Interface lets you do, is apply TLS encryption on that service. So mutual TLS will essentially encrypt that traffic between the two services. I will set up the certificates for you or rotate. How many people enjoy setting up certificates? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no one ever puts a hand up at that one. Uh, really nice thing with this is it does it all for you. So it, said it has a um, trusted uh, root certificate authority within the, the Istio itself. It will set up the uh, certificates. It will rotate the certificates for you. You just have to enable the feature. And that's all you do, just say, I want I want MTLS enabled, and you get it. Don't need to set up, don't need to set up Let's Encrypt or anything like that yourself. <clears throat> so that kind of scarpers anyone snooping on the traffic that's being sent over the wire. Well, if somebody was able to somehow break into a container, for example, you know, gain some kind of shell into a container, they could then maybe make a call to product ratings and get, you know, access that data, access the API. So we're not sniffing traffic anymore. We're making a request to a service we shouldn't really be talking to. And again, with uh, Istio and Service Mesh, <coughs> what you can do is you can apply policies that say, well, a product rating service should only ever be called by product reviews and nothing else. So then if there's any attempts to call that from another service, th that request will get blocked. And you can see how this is working. That proxy is sitting there. The proxy is just checking the policies as requests are coming in and out and supplying the rules. So that's pretty cool. So talk about traffic shifting. Well, I mentioned traffic shifting, so let's explain what that is. So in this uh, application here, I've got it deployed. I've got all my services running. And now I want to work on v2 of my product review service. 
And uh, so I create V2. And what I can do is I can deploy this into production. Where's the best place to test your code? Production. Yeah, we all know that. Um, so what I can do is I can deploy this code into my cluster. And what I can then do is set up some rules that say, for example, if the user is JSON, and I say slightly misleading here, but essential what it's doing is looking at layer seven, the layer seven um, network request. So for example, if there's a header, in this example, it's actually the demo I'll show you, it's a header. It's a header called username, and it's JSON. So if JSON kind of hits the front end, he'll actually get his request will get routed to V2. <coughs> And then that will go back to the existing ratings, whatever it's calling. So he'll see the V2 version of our reviews instead of the V1. Anyone else will see the V1. Let's say we're happy with that. We may then want to implement, oh, my animation's a bit wonky. Um, we may want to do a canary deployment. So canary deployment is where we send a subset of our traffic to uh, services and we monitor them and we see how they behave. So this is a key thing that when I showed you the ingress earlier for Kubernetes, it doesn't have this capability. It doesn't have the the header capability either. So you can't send subset of traffic. You can either send everything to one or the other, which is why these things are being created. So now with the Canary deployment, what we can do is we can send 10% of our traffic um, to V2. Everyone else gets V1. And then if we're happy, we can start incrementing that number. And there's actually a really cool project out there called Flagger, which works with Service Mesh Interface. And it automates this <coughs> rolling out of this Canary deployment. So what it does is it will start incrementing that number and will monitor for errors. And if there's any errors, it will stop the rollout. If not, it'll continue to roll out based on how you've told it to roll out. And it will start incrementing that deployment and eventually roll over all the way to V2, which is pretty cool. Uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a quick demo of that a little bit later. Uh, another nice thing, which I haven't got slides for, and I keep on mentioning and I should add some in, is you can do things like uh, traffic mirroring. So if you imagine if I go back to this one, um, traffic mirroring essentially lets you send the same traffic that goes to V1 also to V2. So it's really nice thing with this is you can launch, you can deploy your V2 service, and then you can watch it and see how it behaves with the real production traffic. See so how does it deal with it? Check the, you know, you've got logging or telemetry or monitoring, CPU usage, memory usage. All the users are going through the V1 path. All you're seeing, all it is is the, the, copy, the traffic's essentially being mirrored duplicated and being sent to the V2 as well. And then there's other projects there that let you do some kind of scientific comparison between the outputs and the inputs between the two to make sure that they're matching. <coughs> so that's pretty cool as well. So it lets you launch applications or launch services darkly, if you like, um, see how they behave, and then start sending some users, subset of the users. And this could be a user agent strings, for example, or an all mobile users, all mobile users in a certain country, whatever you have available on the layer seven. Traffic request, right. It's getting pretty hot in here, I'm sweating. Um, so that was kind of traffic shifting. Oops. Yeah. Finally, um, so Istio has built in, it kind of collects metrics using Prometheus. Prometheus is a really popular kind of metric server within Kubernetes. And it has uh, Grafana dashboards. Hopefully I'll show you these in a second. So you can see service level metrics. And the really nice thing with with this is you can see number of requests to a service. You know, that's not normally something that's easy to see within your actual application. Request per second coming to a service and request per second being found out <coughs> to other services and how long that request is taking. And finally, you can have distributed tracing so you can see where your request was hitting, what other services hit, how long it took. And again, hopefully I'll show you this in a, in a demo. So <coughs> in the demo application I'm gonna show you, is basically what I've just talked through. So I've got this kind of um, book info. This is the demo app that Istio uses. So if you go and play with it yourself, you'll see hopefully exactly what I'm showing you now. The V1 version of product reviews doesn't um, have uh, any stars at all. And then the V2 version now shows stars for the ratings. So what you'll see is we'll see some stars. So switch over to demo. <coughs> I've normally been doing a video for this demo as well, but I wanted to um, wanted to update it for the latest um, Istio version. So that's why I'm running it locally, but it's clearly caning my machine as well. So if it all goes horribly wrong, it's because of that and not because I'm rubbish. Um, so let me just close this. Come on, it's a bit stuck. OK. 
close that, don't need that anymore. So uh, let's open a command line, let's do some typing. So I've got, I'm running Docker, Docker Desktop, uh, so this is Windows machine, I'm running, this is Commander, so it's just the Windows terminal, for, you know, as much as it matters. And if I have a look at, uh, incidentally, so Kubernetes, you use the command line tool called kube control, kube cuttle. I've aliased it to K, so every time you see me type K, I'm, that's kube control. So if I, do, um, if I do get pods on the namespace for Istio, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff running here. Um, that's fine. And then what I've done is I've deployed the application itself. So if I do get pods just on the default namespace, you can see that, oops, hopefully everyone can see that I've got details page, I've got product page, and then I've got uh, ratings, and then I've got reviews V1 and V2. So both V1 and V2 of the reviews site I've currently deployed to my production app, if you like. Um, so let me open the app, and that's this one here. Hopefully everyone can see that. It's just, yeah, just a book app, and ouch, that was my knee. Um, you can see here, we've got the reviews and there's no stars here. So I'm just going to refresh that just to make sure it's up to date. That's refreshed. There's no stars here. Uh, I'm going to set up a rule that lets Jason see the stars. So let me just log in as Jason now. Jason's got a really secure password. Um, and see, Jason doesn't see anything different. So Jason sees exactly the same thing that everyone else is seeing. Let me just sign out. So now what we can do is we can apply a rule that says if the user is JSON, then let them see the V2, which is the one with the stars. <clears throat> let me show you that rule quickly. And uh, hopefully everyone can see that. So the, um, it's reasonably straightforward, I think, anyway. So virtual service is what um, Istio calls it. And essentially, here's the rule that says for the reviews, match the HTTP header. Um, there's a header called end user, and if it's exactly JSON, then send them to V2 of reviews. Pretty much everyone else gets V1. That's the rule. So what I should be able to do now is apply that rule. So I'll just check I'm in the right folder. Yep. So if I now apply that rule, <coughs> and it's JSON. So it's important to understand here, I'm not restarting the application. I'm not resigning the cluster. This is just a new rule applied to my cluster. If I now come back to the application, I'm not logged in. If I refresh it, you see I'm not still still not seeing the stars. Nothing's nothing's changed here. As soon as I sign in as Jason, and everything is working fine, hopefully, we see the stars. So now Jason's seeing the V2. And if I sign out, stars are gone. What I could do now is once we're happy with that, what we can do is we can say, well, let's send. 50% of the traffic, for example, I won't do that. I'm just going to send everyone. So now what I can do is I can okay, apply dash F <coughs> and let's send all people to V2. And I come back out and now refresh this. We're all seeing the V2. So now we can get rid of the V1 if we wanted to. As I said, I'm doing that manually. That took a flagger lets you actually automate this if you wanted to as well. So that's that's the kind of traffic shifting really, really crudely and really quickly. Um, <clears throat> I'm conscious of time. What I want to show you is also some of the dashboards. So go to my little um, handy output. So what I need to do is I need to just port forward the Grafana dashboard. So let's just do that. And now if I open that link, we're seeing now, this is the Istio, this is the built-in dashboards that Istio gives you. Um, you can do whatever you want, you can change it afterwards, um, you can add your own. Um, but you can see, I can see my different services, see the number of requests, I can see the latency, you know, P50, P90, P99, latency, success rates. So you can see some of these services haven't been called. Um, I can dive into um, more specific details of a particular service. You'll see this is the detail service. Let's just go to product page or something. And let me just check that it's due so far today or something. It's not really. Yeah. You need to hit it a bit more to get a better idea of what's going on. But you can see there's there's a heap of information here that you wouldn't. And then all of this stuff is arguably free. You know, as soon as you've got the service mesh there, you're getting this information. <coughs> so that's kind of visibility of the 
metrics of your system. Um, one of the things you have when you have a microservice application is how, does it, how do you visualize it? How are the things connected? So you're new to a system and new to an application. How do you understand what system is talking to what? Which service is talking to what? This is a new addition. I hadn't seen this before. This has been added more recently. So this is called Kiali, I think. We, um, as always, have a problem with pronouncing things in cloud native world. Let me kill that one. Let's just port forward that. And now if I open this one, <coughs> what it should let us do is create a app graph. So now I can see the different versions of my application. I can see what's calling what. So you get a bit more details. You understand how your system is looking. I've not had a chance to play with this much. There's probably a lot more stuff in there that I'm not showing you in any great, great detail. But um, more information that you, know, you might want to see from when it was deployed, error rates, ports it's using, various other things. Um, so that's Kiali. And then the last one I wanted to show you was the distributed tracing. So let's just kill this. Let's port forward. Let me just clear that. Come on. So what this is, is something called Jaeger. So Jaeger is essentially the UI for exploring distributed traces within the system. So what I can do is I can pull up a uh, product page. Let me just find traces. And what I get is I get this bubble chart up here. So you can see the different requests. We can see how long they took. So what we can do, for example, we can look for outliers here. Well, why was that? Why was that particularly slow? What was going on there? So what I can do is I can click on one of these. Oops. Click on it again. And I get this, uh, uh, I think you call it um, waterfall chart, fire chart. I, think, I can't remember the exact terminology some people use. What I can see is I can see the requests coming in, hit the product page, I went to the details page. And the product page also went to reviews, reviews went to ratings, and I can see how long each of those request components took. This is all out of the box. Uh, it's important to mention here, though, that this, <coughs> what we're seeing here is purely service-to-service -service communications. There's no context around the business activity that was going on. So if you're really doing this, you really should use the same tooling, the same um, so open telemetry now. I used to call open tracing. Use the same libraries and actually emit traces which are contextual to your business request, you know, how long did it take a user to complete their shopping cart, you know, do that whole business flow, if you like, journeys, but really cool. And again, this is stuff that you're, you would never have had visibility over before unless you did it yourself, for various means, you now got a consistent way of seeing these. Cool. As I said, feel free to ask questions as we go along, if you want. That was the end of the demo. Not long, not too much more to go, I think. Um, <coughs> so well done for hanging in. And let's come back to our checklist. So hopefully I've shown you when built on top of Kubernetes, you get now you know quite a lot of power with the networking and traffic routing. Get that tracing and logging across the services. And then also we've improved the security kind of position a lot more now with the ability to encrypt services. It's really important if you're moving existing applications to the, you know, where you maybe have data center zoning, you need to replicate that potentially. It's another way to do it. So coming to wrap up now, just to summarize, <coughs> these cloud native technologies will help alleviate some of the technical complexity that microservice architectures have created. Now it's important to say they weren't, they weren't created first, they were created as a response to. So it's you know, really important to understand that you don't just decide to use Kubernetes because you want to and it's cool. Um, really, really important. Complexity is very rarely removed. You know, I talked about the whole thing about Kubernetes to solve one of these challenges. The way I like to think about this is you want to shift the complexity to, until it's somebody else's problem. This is like the first law of thermodynamics. You know. Energy is not created or destroyed, just changed from one form to another. Change it to a former is somebody else's problem, not yours. So the managed Kubernetes providers, it's their problem to manage the Kubernetes cluster for you, not yours. So in the same way, you know, Istio and things like that, service meshes are becoming more and more common. There'll be a tick box option on your cloud, cloud provider at some point. You know, uh, it's already the case in, in Google, GKE. 
don't be peer pressured into adopting microservices. And again, it feels like you know if you're working in a system that's a monolith, and monolith's a bad word, and you can feel a bit depressed. You come to meetups and everyone's talking about how cool microservices are, and then you go back to your monolith written in VB6, and you're feeling a bit depressed. Honestly, don't be. Um, the reality is most people are in your boat, not the boat that the cool people are talking about. We're well, not cool people. People are talking about it is because they're doing some new stuff. Um, if you're ever in doubt, don't do microservices. If you're doing a new project, arguably shouldn't do microservices at the start. Uh, the tooling is an area of rapid innovation. As I said, you know, it's changing all the time. So this talk is kind of doomed to failure on that front if I'd spent too long on it. Um, I'm sure things have changed already. And then service mesh is really interesting and they can help solve some problems. But don't think that you know, you're going to adopt Docker or containers, then Kubernetes and service meshes all in one go. You know, each one of these things has a cognitive overhead, has a load. How many of your, you know, if, you're, if you work in a team, how many, how many of your team are in this room now learning about this stuff? Reality is, you know, it's very rare. So you're, you're the odd one out. You're the 1% you know, as you know, um, Scott Ansible calls the dark matter developers. So you can't adopt these things without having you know, a broad base of knowledge across your teams. So this is where maybe some workshops, things like that can be really handy as well. If you want to learn more, <coughs> as I said, if you're new to Kubernetes, particularly from a .NET perspective, um, actually, there's not much .NET in it. But that talk I gave ages ago now um, will really introduce the key concepts, some of the, some of the things I didn't dive into about retries and um, health checking, things like that. I cover in that talk there. Um, these two books are really cool. The one I want to really give a shout out to is Catacoda. Catacoda is awesome. Anyone? People heard of Catacoda? There's a handful of people, but not many. It's always the case, which is awesome. So if you've got a work laptop and you've got corporate policies, I mean, you can't install Docker desktop on there, so you can't play around with these things. Um, if you've got a web browser and internet connection, you can play with Kubernetes. You can play with Istio. You can play with OpenShift. You can play with most of the cloud native technologies. So it's a free online learning platform. There's some stickers for them over there as well on that table. Um, this is where I learned most of what I learned about Kubernetes from hoovering up all the content on here. Gives you an interactive window, gives you some instructions on the left-hand side. Terminal windows, which are actually running on a machine somewhere. So you're typing in code, you're running it. It's awesome. Istio docs are pretty good as well, um, quite detailed. And then I think that's all I've got to say on that. So I'll just say thank you very much. Um, the slides are available at that link there. There is a version of this talk. There's various versions. I've refreshed them more recently. Um, which is available at that link. I can't even remember which one that points to now, but there's versions of this talk I've done a few times. Obviously, it's been recorded here as well. I recommend watching that one. Um, otherwise, contact details are there. Again, please get in touch if you've got any questions or you want to learn more. And I'll say thank you very much and happy to take questions. And I'll try and repeat them for the recording. I'm, inter I'm interested in state, and I do appreciate you actually to talk about state. I'm actually interested in stateful states and for stateful sets. Unfortunately, we might be setting up a Kubernetes cluster at work and I don't know how to uh, replicate state on our own infrastructure. State is hard. Yeah, yeah. fundamentally state is hard. Although, I mean, to be fair, <coughs> Kubernetes people will say we shouldn't say that anymore, but uh, I still prefer to externalize the state user managed service. So why would I run? I can run, I can run SQL Server in Linux in a container but do I want to? Is a question you've got to ask yourself. Can I run on SQL Azure, managed instances, or SQL Azure? I have so many more capabilities. I don't need to be sitting there trying to manage and run it myself. Um, same goes for um, you know, file storage, blob storage, things like that. Just externalize them. There are ways of integrating them a bit closer to Kubernetes. So actually, you are <coughs> interacting only with the Kubernetes API. It's actually provisioning resources in the cloud for those things. Um, but yeah, stateful cells is the way around that. But they are, they're not simple, and they have some additional challenges. Cool. There's a lot to take in, I appreciate. Um, and it's end of a long day already. So uh, there's no more questions. No? Why would I go like, from to Kubernetes from like, cloud native like, from like EKS and what is your service fabric mesh? Uh, so specifically, we have Service Fabric. So, um, Service Fabric is now not the recommended approach for doing microservices architectures. So, if you've got stuff already, it's fine. It'll stay there. It'll keep. It'll be there for a long time. But <clears throat> there's probably not going to be any huge new investment in that side. Uh, Kubernetes 
is ubiquitous. So the key thing, Service Fabric is, it's actually an open source runtime, so you could take it and run it everywhere else. But can you get a managed Service Fabric instance on any other cloud provider? No, but you can Kubernetes. So that's probably the argument for Kubernetes is it gives you that ability to, now moving or having multiple clouds is a huge amount of overhead in terms of just governance. That's not, not straightforward, but that's one of the key reasons is have a ubiquitous platform. Also, in the future, hiring people who know Kubernetes is going to be a lot easier than hiring people who know Service Fabric Mesh. A lot of people know ECS. Yeah, ECS, again, but I think ECS is a, is a container orchestrator that's kind of custom. But again, you can imagine that Amazon, AWS will eventually move everything to EKS and they won't, you know, ECS will just be the legacy product that will sit there. The thing with Kubernetes is it's, you know, it's still innovating, it's still rapidly. You know, Kubernetes has a release every three months, if I'm not mistaken. The last release, uh, 1.15, came out a little while ago and they, it was a stabilization release. They actually didn't include too many new features. But, you know, it's, it's so ubiquitous now that actually it's, it's almost... Um, if you're already running one of the other platforms, there's no reason to rush and, and, and get rid of them. If you're starting a new project now or you're looking to migrate now, then I wouldn't be using Service Fabric or ECS or whatever. Cool. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, yeah, thank you very much.